On today's World Insight, top trade envoys from each country converge at the WTO Ministerial Conference. Can these ministers clinch deals to keep confidence in global trade alive? Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Ken Wei. The trade ministers of WTO members gathered for the very first time in four years for what is known as MC12 in Geneva. The meeting started on Sunday and has been extended by one day until Thursday in order to facilitate outcomes on the main issues under discussion. Representatives from the WTO's 164 members discussed the issues including pandemic response, fishery subsidies, food security, as well as the WTO's reform and priorities. At the opening of MC12, China's Commerce Minister Wang Wentao said China is willing to work with all parties so the WTO could play a bigger role in global economic recovery. So how can the WTO reform to arbitrate trade in the new era? What has the conference achieved so far? Let's ask our panelists. Joining us for the discussion for the ongoing WTO Ministerial Conference on Global Trade in Washington, Jeffrey Schott, Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. In Boston, Joe Trenchman, who is a professor of international law at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy with Tufts University. In Beijing, we have Jörg Wetka, President of the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China. Later, we're also going to be joined by a Chinese panelist. Let me start by asking the three of you, what do you make of the significance of this ministerial level meeting among WTO members? Some say it's a make or break moment. Some say it's too much exaggeration. Now, Mr. Schott, your take. Well, it's not a make or break moment for the WTO but it, there are important global crises that need to be addressed uh, with regard to the pandemic, with regard to the global food crisis, with regard to the climate crisis. And uh, the WTO doesn't hold the answers or uh, have the, the ability to resolve these problems. And uh, hopefully the ministers will get together and do something constructive. Mr. Professor uh, Trentman, Tell me more about your thoughts on this. As we know, this is going to focus a lot on the issue of uh, IPR waiver of the vaccines for COVID-19. How much hope are we having right now? Well, you know, they've been working really since the pandemic began on a, a vaccine waiver. And it's uh, still uncertain whether they'll reach agreement this time. Um, there is also uh, discussion about uh, export restrictions on vaccines and medicines, as well as on food. But as Mr. Mm. Schott has said, there are many issues and it will be good if the WTO can make some progress uh, as kind of a confidence building measure. Mm. Mr. Woodka, as the head of the EU Chamber in China, what are you looking at about this ministerial conference? Well, I frankly look at the fringes of Geneva's meeting because uh, for the first time, uh, MOFCOM Minister Wang uh, actually flew to Switzerland. And that in itself is significant because so far, uh, Chinese uh, top politicians were basically limited to foreign affairs specialists. So it's the first time this Summer went out uh, and uh, it showed results. Uh, there was a meeting with EU uh, Vice President Dombrovskis. Um, they met on the sidelines and they agreed on the high economic dialogue, which is supposed to take place uh, in the first week uh, of July. We have been waiting for this announcement for a long time. Many things can maybe not resolve, but at least can be clarified. And now we're also joined by in Beijing, Xu Sitao, Chief Economist from Deloitte, China. Mr. Xu, good to see you. 
Now, Thank you. We were earlier talking about the significance of this ministerial meeting and what are expectations from different speakers. Your take. Uh, this year, um, global trade is facing uh, quite a few uh, headwinds, uh, not just uh, high energy price, uh, inflation, and also, uh, you know, geopolitical uh, flashpoint, which resulted in uh, reduced trust. All these issues will be addressed uh, at the meeting. Among all the issues, uh, one of the overhanging theme is what are we going to do with uh, what we earlier all agreed upon, which is a uh, globalization. Uh, that seemed to be the basis of uh, WTO. Uh, Mr. Shah, you've been with WTO and studying WTO history for quite some time. Uh, your take? Well, the post-war international economic system was based on rulemaking. Uh, and, but the, the rulemaking isn't static. It has to be updated. And so the challenge that the WTO has had since the beginning is how do you get countries together to address the concerns uh, that are and problems that have arisen in the 21st century? How do you set new rules to govern digital trade, uh, the rules for the digital economy? Uh, how do you address the nexus of trade and climate change issues? Something critically important for the United States, Europe, and China, uh, and of perhaps even existential uh, importance for many developing countries. So this is this is the challenge, not deglobalization, uh, but setting the rules of the road uh, that will allow. Uh, all the members of the WTO to continue to use trade and investment to boost the economic uh, performance of their countries. Now, Jorg, uh, tell me more about your thoughts on this as well. There is uh, a lot of content going on between states already outside WTO. It's the so-called spaghetti bowl of uh, trade relationships. Uh, and you can see in these uh, free trade agreements that, for example, the European Union is signing with Vietnam, with Singapore and Korea, how deep and how broad they are, basically addressing not only uh, trade issues, but also uh, environmental areas, uh, sustainability, but also labor law, and so on and so on. So as a matter of fact, uh, WTO has to really see how they can sort of extract something and add additional value to this. Again, we are running the risk of having a, a, a spaghetti ball of, of trade relationships. Let me come back to this uh, vaccine issue, you know. Um, it clearly, uh, there's a need in order to have uh, uh, affordable vaccine, uh, in particular uh, because of the upcoming next wave of uh, Omicron, possibly BA5 uh, in, in fall. Uh, but at the same time, you also have to see that companies actually put efforts in there uh, in order to get uh, where they want to be. Um, and many companies actually are trying hard but fail. So it's not just yeah. two companies that offer mRNA, there are 10 or 20 actually that fail. And do you want to discourage companies by saying, okay, you can try very hard, but at the same time, even if you uh, uh, succeed, uh, we are going to get you only the basics. That's not enticing okay. for business. Well, of course, the, the vaccine issue is at the WTO because the TRIPS agreement is part of the WTO beginning in 1995. The TRIPS agreement is an agreement to protect patent rights and other intellectual property in all of the countries of, of the WTO. And it was an important uh, part of the agreement for the United States and, and for the European Union in order to protect the intellectual property that their companies develop. But the point I wanted to make is that that was an area that was new, that was alongside the WTO. It wasn't a traditional trade issue. And I think, as Mr. Schott has said, we now have to deal with a lot of other non-trade issues like labor and climate and gender and cybersecurity and digital trade. And it's not fair, I think, to the WTO to demand that the WTO answers all of those questions itself, that it's not right for the WTO to even try. But those questions will need to be answered for international society. And it may be that the WTO won't be able to proceed to liberalize trade further. It may go backwards unless we answer some of these questions. It seems that you are saying, Professor, that it is 
uh, the fact that WTO is both now enriched by many of the issues that is outside the trade area, but at the same time, unfairly treated because WTO is vulnerable to all these issues as this is not their uh, expertise. Yes, where a non-trade issue is posing a threat, as you said, to the trade system. And it can't necessarily be addressed solely from a trade perspective. It has to be addressed from a broader perspective. Now, Mr. Xu, your thoughts also. If you recall, in the initial phase of pandemic, we talk about the vaccine passport, we talk about travel bubble. I mean, if you conceptualize all this, they should not be difficult. But today, they are still facing a lot of challenges. So I would attribute this to lack of trust. So that's clearly related to the deal. Mr. Woodcock's point on spaghetti balls uh, is a very uh, interesting point. Uh, I think there is a merit of some of the spaghetti balls. So for example, this year, uh, RCEP is going to uh, have some tangible uh, impact uh, on regional uh, trade and the economic integration. And I hope this can generate some momentum and to expand into service area. Maybe we create some uh, convergence between RCEP and the CPTP, and ultimately, I think that would uh, make maybe just one spaghetti ball instead of many spaghetti balls. Mm. You know, we see at this moment, though, besides this global mechanism, other regional ones are already flourishing. Of course, at different stages, RCEP, TPP, we also have uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework proposed by the United States. How do you see this uh, coexistence of so many options. How do you see its impact on the current negotiation going on at the WTO? Uh, Professor Trenchman. There is a, a proliferation of these regional trade agreements and they result in zero tariffs, zero taxes on imports. And they also try to address other things like digital commerce and climate and, and labor issues, which have been important uh, to the United States and to other countries. In addition to that part of the spaghetti bowl, there is also a, a new initiative in the World Trade Organization to have plurilateral agreements, uh, these uh, joint statement initiatives, as they're called, on things like domestic regulation of uh, services, uh, gender, e-commerce, uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises, and investment facilitation for development. So we have, as you suggest, a proliferation of different bodies with different rules. And in a way, it's, it's right, because different countries have different things that they're trying to achieve. Uh, but there is a risk of fragmentation of the trade system, and um, partly in connection with geopolitical geopolit problems and security issues between countries like the United States and China uh, and with Russia and Ukraine, we could see a splintering of the trade system that would make everyone less well off. And so I think one of the big challenges is to avoid that splintering because of the failure to address some of these issues well and multilaterally and because of these geopolitical tensions. Mr. Woodka, if being constructive, what are the things that we can start with at least so that we can at least instill some kinds of hope and confidence into the overall discussion? I must say that for business, it's really complicated to actually distinguish between all these abbreviations. Uh, every clan, every group uh, puts up its own RCP on the one hand, and there used to be TPP and all of a sudden becomes something else. Uh, we actually want uh, some more simplification and clarity in, in what's uh, being discussed. And let me just point out one area, um, uh, climate change. I think for business now fighting climate change, it would be very helpful to see that companies are not subject to export bans, that companies are not subject to all kinds of um, uh, uh, problems in market access issues. 
uh, because we have to get the best equipment to where the emissions are being uh, coming out. And 25% of emissions are coming out of China. So we have to make really sure that maybe in WTO, they actually make a special point of making the trade and the trade of goods in uh, climate change issues much, much easier. We really depend on this. This is not a little area. Mr. Schott, uh, go ahead. Uh, your thoughts. Basically, the WTO has had a problem in, in getting a consensus on new liberalization. If the WTO uh, loses the confidence of its, of its member countries, then there's a risk that we will uh, have more and more actions that ignore WTO requirements and violate and roll back the liberalization. And I don't think that risk is as appreciated as much as it should be by the major trading nations and by the developing countries that have the most to lose if the rules-based system erodes. Uh, we already have a, a negotiation on fish subsidies to put disciplines on fish subsidies that have been going on for 20 years uh, effort to try to resolve the negotiation uh, at this uh, ministerial, but the uh, terms of the agreement have been so watered down that they will not make much of a difference, even if the agreement is reached, which seems to me unlikely anyway. So uh, what we need is a recommitment. Uh, uh, my friend Bob Zellick used to call it be a responsible stakeholder. And uh, it recognize the value of, of having a well-functioning international agreement and uh, make an investment in the institution and in, and in the agreements under that institution. Many of the issues that the other panelists mentioned are very crucial issues and I would assume members of WTO also understand that. Yet they are uh, geopolitical uh, as well as uh, real interest limits. Do you see uh, picking up on the vaccine issue could be some kinds of easier showcase of uh, the WTO members' spirit to work together? Vaccine, uh, I wouldn't say is a low hanging fruit. Uh, but it's a very important point. Uh, I made uh, this point very clear. Even two years ago, uh, we could have had a vaccine passport and something so easy, but just simply could not be done. And of course, and all this data sharing and all this uh, needy gritty issues could not be re resolved, mainly due to uh, lack of trust. And first of all, China has benefited enormously from uh, its accession into the WTO in 2001. The second point is, I understand there are some misgivings towards so-called fragmentation. But if I use analogy sports, for example, sometimes the league is getting so big, so you don't even know how decision being made, commissioner getting so powerful, athletes may not be getting the fair share. So you could have competing leagues. I mean, it happens in sports, you could have many leagues. So there's no reason actually for, you know, not to have some of the, this regional trade agreement because all this regional trade agreement for uh, emerging market like China does represent step changes towards economic integration. So I hope at the same time, China can also um, look at CPTPP and the Indo-Pacific economic framework. And instead of just dismissing that as a small beer or small potato, because some of the rule settings also important. But again, coming back to you, I think it would be wonderful to have vaccine passport this year. You all talk about regional trade mechanisms. But we know many of the trade mechanisms that we see today are out of uh, different uh, development stages. For example, uh, in the Asia Pacific region, particularly among, between China and the Southeast Asian nations, uh, they all consider themselves as uh, mainly developing countries. And uh, the standards and the concerns and also 
uh, the, the strategies and solutions, they seem to have quite similar visions. Uh, however, WTO, it is a different story because it is everybody almost. So uh, do you see a regional and the sectorial frameworks will provide some kinds of inspiration for WTO? when we talk about the rules and the updates of the rules. Regional trading arrangements have been negotiating laboratories uh, for WTO rulemaking, for GATT rulemaking for the past 40 years. So that's nothing new. And negotiators, I, I can tell you from experience, negotiators learn by doing. Uh, and until you really sit down and try to write rules that resolve problems, you don't understand the problem very well because you start writing it and then you say, well, that's not going to take care of it. I, there's another aspect that I have to address. So having the experience of rulemaking is, is, is important. The rules will only apply to those that sign on to them. Uh, and that's why there's a difference between the RCEP and the CPTPP. Interestingly, there are a lot of members of RCEP who want to advance, uh, to sign on to more advanced rulemaking, and they participate in both agreements. And several of the RCEP members are considering additionally joining the uh, uh, CPTPP like uh, South Korea. So it's, uh, it's a system where the WTO over time could take advantage of the experience of the regional arrangements and come up with the sort of best practices. Uh, but for right now, given the uh, difficulty in getting any rulemaking passed through the WTO, it's worthwhile to at least have these, uh, these new solutions coming up affecting significant uh, portions of world trade. Mm -hmm. Professor Trenchman, your thoughts? Um, I'm reminded of uh, the great trade economist Jagdish Bhagwati, who spoke in the 1990s about uh, building blocks versus stumbling blocks referring to this connection. And in a sense, these regional agreements, just as Mr. Schott has said, are uh, opportunities to experiment. They're opportunities to accept liberalization of a certain kind that will maybe make it easier to move from regional liberalization to multilateral liberalization. Uh, but on the other hand, they could be stumbling blocks because they create regional trade in a way that uh, some interests will want to protect that trade from competition from outside. I think the problem, the fundamental problem we have today is one of uh, politics, of course, and uh, populism in the United States uh, that has turned its back on and scapegoated international trade, also in India. And so you have two leading countries that don't have really sufficient political support for moving forward. And I think that what we have to do in order to move forward is to see change in those countries or, or identify uh, opportunities to get businesses in those different countries excited about multilateral liberalization so that they'll lobby uh, in their countries for uh, liberalization in a broader sense. That, that's the way we've done it in the past, and it may be the, the key to the future. It seems that uh, even though the business could be a little bit confused about what exactly these frameworks are, they are moving forward and they might be uh, an additional inspiration for WTO, even though difficult with, with uh, a lot of challenge. Well, I mean, we have to uh, be weary about the hype that some of these agreements uh, uh, create because RCEP, for example, uh, when it comes to trading of goods, uh, it lowers a couple of uh, tariffs uh, over 20 or 30 years. Uh, and uh, to a very little extent, and actually the whole deal is very shallow. So yes, there are some advantages. At the same time, again, it just shows that they went for the smallest denominator, the easiest or the last deal they could grasp. So in a way for WTO, it's very difficult in order to actually find a common ground when you have uh, countries like India being very reluctant and having strong interest groups pushing back. And then you have those that actually already way ahead like Vietnam, uh, down the road uh, in order to compromise. Business actually really wants to have specific um, uh, agreements where we can rely 
on uh, security of our IPR, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, we can be sure that uh, forced labor is being addressed in, in these agreements and so on. The world is getting more and more politicized and complex, and it's really difficult for us to maneuver our business. All right. Uh, Mr. Xu. I wouldn't say RCEP has a shallow uh, structure. If we recall, uh, actually the whole negotiation uh, was so uh, such a lengthy process. And in the end, India decided not to join, which is a great shame. And the ratification process uh, in some of the countries is not exactly smooth sailing. And we all know due to historical reasons and, and the geopolitics, there's no free trade agreement in North Asia and where economic integration is happening at a rapid pace. So this is indeed a useful platform uh, for us to see step changes towards economic integration. And, and, and even developed countries like Australia, New Zealand, they do not want to be left out. Uh, tell me more about what do you think uh, need to be done just out of your mind right now at this moment that you would like to share with those at at the conference for the ministerial meeting of the WTO? I would repeat what I said before, the critical importance of having a uh, rules-based trading system. It's really the rules-based system has, has guided the post-war development uh, that has benefited all, all our countries. But uh, rededicating to a rules-based international system is something that I think the United States and China need to be in the forefront in leading the world community. Mr. Woodcock, briefly. But I think we have to be humble and have a small achievement in order to gain trust and do a baby step in the right direction. And again, to me, it's climate change. It's about trading of uh, renewable items, about new technologies that should be eased, should be supported among us because the climate okay. is not going to wait for us to solve our problems. Mr. Xu. Well, we all know the global economy is facing a severe risk of stagflation. So I hope we can see uh, the reduction of tariffs between China and the United States go back to uh, 2018 level. That's the first thing. Secondly, we also understand there are a lot of political hurdles between China and the EU on bilateral investment treaty. So maybe we can implement some of this in the treaty without even going for the whole treaty. Maybe that's baby step as Mr. Woodka has alluded. Okay, last but not least, uh, uh, Professor Trenchman. The globalization has caused the world to become a smaller place, globalization, technology, and we see some global problems, uh, obviously climate change and disease, and our ability to deal with those global problems is, uh, is sadly limited. And, and I think one of the problems is that the WTO and the international legal system as a whole is based on consensus, is based on having each state have a veto over action. And we don't accept that kind of a system in any of our countries. And so we right. need a better way to make decisions. And, and we also need to revive in the WTO, the appellate body to have a rules-based system. I want to thank all of you for your insights and also your frank uh, discussion on the future of WTO. Really appreciate it. That's a discussion about the ongoing MC12, the 12th ministerial meeting of the WTO, World Trade Organization. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to know more, search World Insight or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of my team, thanks for being with us.